Welcome everyone to the Wisdom Gym. And today we have a special guest I'm particularly excited about, Stephen Jenkinson, who's been on Rebel Wisdom before and is coming to the Wisdom Gym today to share some wisdom. And Stephen uh, is an author, he's a storyteller, he's a cultural activist. Uh, he's also the founder of Orphan Wisdom, which is a, a teaching house for skills of deep living and, and for the making of human culture, as they describe it. And uh, as well as that, he's, he's perhaps best known uh, as a leading voice in changing our attitudes towards death and dying. So he's the subject of a great documentary, which I highly recommend, called Grief Walker. And he's also the author of a book called Die Wise. And most recently, uh, a book called Come of Age, The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. So Stephen, thanks for, for coming back on Rebel Wisdom. Pleasure, good to see you again. Likewise. And Stephen, you know, your, your most recent book, you have, you know, the case for elderhood in a time of trouble. And I think a lot of people feel that we live in, in troubled times, whether that's socially or economically or the, the health of our institutions. I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what's the link between the times we find ourselves in and our attitudes towards death. The link. Well, let's start with our attitudes towards death. First of all, our is a fairly big word and who knows who we're talking about, right? So why don't I, I I'll limit my observations to the little corner of North America that I haunt. And if anything translates, wouldn't that be great? Um, in that part of the world, we were, you're the one who started it, if I may put it this way. In other words, most of us came from you, no? And uh, you didn't come here voluntarily. Uh, that, that's the unauthorized history uh, or the founding myth of North America is that everybody signed up and couldn't wait. And the truth of the matter is everybody is fleeing for their lives in some fashion or other, either economic lives or sanity lives or, or what have you. So what's the first consequence? that nobody counted on? Answer is, there's a rupture in a kind of con cultural continuity that's never been restored, which is to say that we were obliged to live in North America as foundlings with no particular observable, meaningful, compelling history that answered our fundamental questions, or at least gave us a way of asking them. And the consequence of all of that, among other things, is, well, when it's your turn to die in the new world, unto whom shall you die? And we had no answers, and we still don't. And we've been, in a macabre way, enormously successful in exporting our homelessness across the world uh, and having it masquerade as freedom. So most of the the contending understandings of freedom, certainly in the West, but I think beyond, derive from this sense of dislocation, right? So, so I think then, given that, the, the answer to your question is bordering on the painfully self-evident. When you don't know what becomes of you when you die, when you don't uh, participate and live the fullness of your days in the, with a shared understanding amongst your fellows, as to what's to be and what's to become of you and what is the proper understanding of the deep running obligation between the living and the dead, just to choose three off the shelf, what becomes of us all? And the answer is free radicals, baby. I'd love to circle back to uh, the concept of free radicals in a moment. Okay. Um, so, you know, and I think you don't like this stat from, from what I've heard you say, but you've, you've sat with, in your role as a, a palliative care counselor, you've sat with, with thousands of people as they were dying. And, and you talk in Die Wise about, about this uh, quite beautifully, but I think it'd be useful, or, or I'm, I'm certainly curious um, to hear what is it that you have found people are so afraid of, or perhaps most afraid of as they're, they're facing death? Um. I think the idea of what we were just talking about, what's to become of them, not really in the so-called afterlife, 
but in this life, first of all, I should say that the phrase afterlife is nonsensical and has no meaning once you investigate it, by which I mean, there's a thing called life that includes everything. It includes its end, all its compromises and frailties and so on. It includes people who don't want to be alive, that's life and so forth. So what could possibly be after everything? It, it, you know, as an idea, it doesn't hold. So let's just say there's a thing called life. So our fears are about life, not what comes after it. All our fears are rooted in the way that our life has actually been lived. So in that sense, is we're not, we're not fearful on spec. We're fearful with, with uh, savagely good reason, let's just say. The other thing I think that people were monstrously discomforted by is the sense that they had not lived up to what was entrusted to them. I'm not saying anyone ever said this, because generally speaking, the rendering of it turned into personal anecdote and personal regret. But if you spend enough time with all the personal regrets, there was a cumulative take on things that began to emerge, which had to do with a sense that we were the most optimized people the world had ever seen. And with all our optimum, we were so in a, such a venal way, self-serving, in such a tragic, unnecessary way, self-serving and so limited in our understanding of what our charge was, what our obligations were, that we were constantly trying to renegotiate them to our alleged advantage, which is less obligation. And that's like saying that the solution to heartbrokenness is less heart. A death phobic culture sets the standards for what becomes acceptable, preferable, um, solvable, avoidable, and the rest. So by definition, a death phobic culture has no intent when it comes to dying, except to forestall it as long as possible. And this becomes in and of itself an outcome to be sought. Now that, it, that me results in an extended lifespan, which I can tell you from personal experience tends to be characterized by more symptomatology, more drugs from the symptoms and all of the rest. But nobody bargains for that, you see, because more life is supposed to be its own reward. But lived in a death phobic culture, in the shadow of the fact that you're going to die anyway of this thing that has been temporarily forestalled, does not produce euphoria, does not produce necessarily any kind of enduring, blistering insight that you fall down with grace and gratitude because you're on the receiving end of. Now, all of those observations come from what I saw. I didn't see everything. I didn't see everybody, of course. But of the people I saw, those characterizations are very fair. I'm curious as well about the, the idea of, you know, what, what you were just talking about, being fully optimized, but, but for what, in some sense? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked a few times on the channel about the, the kind of hole at the heart of our culture, which around what's worth dying for. What's worth, because that seems to be a similar question to what's worth living for. Um, and that, that brings me to a concept I've heard you talk about, which is the idea of, of dying well. You know, and what is that, to your understanding, what is it to die well? I actually use the word wise. So let me uh, quibble with the question and put wise in instead of well. The reason for that is if you say well, there's a kind of continuum, right? And there's a kind of tolerable uh, middling hood to that possibility. Whereas if you say wise, you can, I mean, there's no such thing as sort of wise, it seems to me, it's, it's tantamount to sort of pregnant. So that's why I called it die wise. And of course, I'm, I'm very bossy in my titles of these books, right? So it's clear that I'm telling you what to do. I'm not really leaving it up to you. It's saying, well, you could consider or anything of the kind. Largely that sense of mandate on my part came from seeing the consequences of people failing to do so. That's really where, genuinely where it comes from. So um, some of the attributes, I think the principal attribute of die, dying wise is the understanding that the word wise does not refer to your manner of dying. It refers to you, comma, dying. What's the difference? It's grammatical on the surface of it, 
That is, if I had put the emphasis on your manner of dying, I would have been colluding with the idea that it's true that no matter what a profligate and truant life you had lived up until your dying time, you're more than capable of undertaking an 11th hour transformation, you know, with or without psilocybin or whatever your choice of distractions might be, and you can pull it off, right? So my, my claim is, here's the news, friends. It's not gonna sound that user-friendly, but it's wise, all right. You shall die in the manner of your living. This is virtually a given. And that's a gift if you embrace it for the challenge and the, the requisite uh, labors that it entails. That's a gift. You're on notice early on that your manner of living basically dictates how you will die. It's not, not the conditions of your death, not the cause, not the timing. It will all, the repertoire that you bring to your dying, you're accumulating now. Please proceed accordingly. That's the fine print on your birth certificate. That's what it says. And when, when we spoke about a year ago, it was the beginning of COVID. And right. I think one of the first questions I asked you was, well, if an individual can die wise, what, what does it look like for a culture to die wise? Because it seemed perhaps, you know, probably it's arguable, but it very much seemed then that our culture was in its death throes. I think, I think it is in its death throes, but maybe had a, maybe got a shot, a booster shot of something, but um Love to hear your take on that now, a year into a fairly extraordinary year that's that's been marked by by death as much as by anything else. What what it takes for a culture to to die wise? Well, the first thing I'd I'd wonder aloud with you about is the characterization that we're somehow, by virtue of the plague, closer to death personally, culturally, existentially, and so on than we were before it. And so here's, here's, let me guide the wondering slightly by suggesting this, that our manner of contending with the fatal aspects of the plague are very recognizable. They don't come from the plague. They come from the time of no plague, right? We were dying anyhow back in those days, right? And the, the actual uh, incidence of death as a percentage of infection is so remarkably low that, that just as a body count question, you really can't make the claim that death is more prevalent as an experience among us, except with the possible ex uh, exemption of this machine that you and I are talking back and forth on. This machine has delivered to us um, drone visions of them not being able to burn all the bodies in Delhi and so on, most recently, right? So you could imagine that this brings you closer to your death in Bristol or Brighton or Brooklyn. But I'm gonna contend that that couldn't be further from the truth. That a droned telecast of unburned bodies simply results in a shudder and a changing of the channel sooner or later. And, and death is no closer than it ever was. You're the first person I've come across uh, who calls it a plague, which I think is very interesting. And I was curious mm. as to why. More <laughs> why? <laughs> well, and, and not jokingly, I did say to you, it, it's my uh, investment in my uh, uh, divinity school education finally is paying off, that I can recognize a plague when I see one and call it as such. But uh, I, another reason, too, is I think all the other, uh, all the other labels... Uh, our attempts to um, freeze it or neutralize it or quiet the thing down. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say something outrageous now, probably for the first time today, and that is that it's, it's grossly disappointing to me, this plague. Here's what I mean. In the early going, when we spoke a year ago, uh, the appearances were... <clears throat> that there were likely to be bodies in the streets. And we know in a very few places that indeed did happen around the world. But generally, certainly in my part of the world, nothing even close happened or will happen. And the thing I lament there is, had there been bodies in the streets, the chance of this becoming a politicized question of compliance with vaccine and so on would have been mitigated, it seems to me. In fact, the whole idea 
that the that the plague is nothing more than the sum total of your attitudes about it would have fallen on deaf ears and perhaps have had very few takers. But because it hasn't been nearly as lethal as it was imagined to be, one of the sad outcomes is it's been gathered into our, our array of prejudices about what we're obliged to obey and what we get a vote on. And God, God help us, hasn't the plague become another lifestyle choice for us to make already? 15 months into it, you know. So a plague it is. But um, if a culture died wise, internal to the culture, they wouldn't notice. They wouldn't know. It's all they have, see. And, and fundamentally, it would be the undoing of our take on it. A few salient features. One would be, Rather than being completely inward turned, a personal possession to, to deal with as I see fit or to dispense with as I see fit, uh, a cent centrifugal, yes, centrifugal arrangement, uh, family and close friends only, an intensely private and so on and so on. Instead of those things, which, which are all tantamount to dissolving the bonds of community. What a, a wise death is, is a chance for the community to reinstate itself, restore itself, reacclimatize itself with its own fundamental doings and misgivings. And it enables itself to proceed accordingly by claiming the death of one of its own as, as its, that means the culture's principal obligation is to see to it that this death is seen to, that the death is is attended to, right? And, and of course, the, the COVID deaths that have happened in the West are generally clothed, blanketed, um, Velcroed, um, acrylic, and so on. And there's no access. And, and I mean, the grievousness of it is certainly not lost on me. But I'm just saying, as a note of sort of caution to go with the giddiness of the prospect of a wise death, is that we had a chance for a wise death before this plague and there weren't many takers. And the chances are that when the pl plague page is turned, um, it's not likely that there'll be a lot of takers for wise death thereafter. There'll be our version of the roaring 20s, perhaps instead. So I would love to circle back to something you said before about free radicals. And it actually ties into something I just noticed in myself as you were talking about death as a community activity, because there has been uh, a, a kind of psychotherapeutization is a very long word, but over the course of however many, maybe 50 years, certainly in my entire lifetime, the language of psychotherapy and the idea of individual improvement and in, in individual dealing with something or looking inward is so pervasive that I notice even as I'm asking you questions about it, it's in the grammar of my thinking it's in, and then in the grammar of my language. And when you right. talked about dying as a community experience, that, that flipped it for me somewhat. And, you know, I would love to, to hear you talk a little bit more about that, this idea of us as free radicals, as kind of separated off from anything else and just kind of floating around. Um, and, and where, you know, where you've seen it, where you've seen the dying process really play out like that, maybe in other cultures, for example, and, and just to kind of hear, hear a bit about the alternative. Uh -huh. Well, you, you actually are hearing about the alternatives from me by articulating the dilemmas, right? Rather than go to the fantasy island of a more intact and indigenous culture, I'm suggesting, first of all, they don't need us. And second of all, our appearance among them is very likely to become a vector for the very death phobic virus that we've been contending with and failing to contend with for a long time. Okay, so as to the, ma the matter of the free radicals, here's the thing, I use the phrase a little bit uh, loosely, let's just say, <clears throat> because I'm not actually buying the idea for a, for a second that we are actually free or radical, <clears throat> excuse me, radical. Not at all. What I'm saying is that in the course of my lived lifetime, most of my fellows 
have proceeded as if that's exactly what they are. Burdened by choice, uh, the giddiness of the free range of available human options, et cetera, and so on, simply because of, by a virtue of an accident of birth, we're born at such a place in time. Dying comes along and you discover that your freedom and your radicalization have been, um, I don't know, the saran wrap with which you tried to clothe yourself back in the day, no? So freedom is mostly obligation with a little bit of lateral movement. I mean, freedom in a, in a, in a serious democracy is mostly the obligation to sustain the democracy, occasionally interrupted by, um, by the exercise of certain lateral movement that those freedoms give you. For example, I'm exercising my obligations as a citizen right now by lamenting over the condition of my citizenship. And until the brown shirts come through the back door and forbid me for doing so, this is one of my, I would say, my obligations. You know, the word radical uh, probably is used too often now. The etymology is helpful. It means, it's an adjective meaning pertaining to the root. It doesn't mean innovative. It means um, an absolute servant of tradition. That's what radical means, a servant and a skion of tradition. Right? You, you're, you're hard pressed to find people exercising their rights to, to freedom and to radicalization with that understanding in tow, I'd say. I would love to also talk about uh, another aspect of what you do, which is music and storytelling. Right. Um, and, you know, I think, I think when we spoke this time last year, everything had been canceled. And that was, I think, uh, you and, and, and many of us were feeling uh, bummed out about that, basically. Quite, and and I'm, I'm curious about what we lose when we lose our storytelling and our face-to-face -face interaction with music. Well, I wish I didn't know, to be honest. I wish I'd never had the experience to be able to draw upon to answer your question. I wish I was able to say, man, who knows what it's like not to have elders because we're, we're festooned with them. But alas, I can't make such a claim about them or about this question you're asking me now. If you think about the, the representation of the court jester in uh, Shakespeare, for example, uh, the court jester gets away with a kind of murder and he's an exercise, he normally, he is an exercise in brinksmanship, right? Always in a cunning sort of way, trying to understand where the line is, stepping over it ever so slightly and generating some possibility of tomorrow in the bargain for him personally. I think that's basically what the gig is. The gig is speak as much authentic, irretrievable candor as you can manage and then plead insanity if you need to. Some combination of those two things give you some shelf life, right? There's a word I'm trying to think of as I'm telling you now. It's not barred, it's, um, it's an Icelandic word. So, uh, that's it. So if I, I'm not gonna try to even mispronounce the Icelandic word, but their word for barred is where we get our verb to scold, S-C-O-L-D. That's fascinating etymology, no? So it's one of the things that helps you understand that a bard or a, a skuld is not an Ikea for the interior life of the culture. You know, decorating it, making it look better than it is, disposable furniture, mostly, well, you understand what I mean, poor Ikea. But uh, what I'm suggesting is that it's, it's the skull's job to do exactly that, to hold our feet to the collective fire when everything inside us is inclined to dismiss uh, the opportunities for radicalized learning as inconvenient or poorly timed. Of course, it fell to me to say, what do you think your remnant ability to speak and to talk is for now, if it's not for cozying up to your demise? We, we live in a time where a lot of artists feel 
afraid to scold because because there's an offense industry and there's um, uh, just just offense everywhere and people seem very thin skinned. Um, what right. what do you make of that? And perhaps what is a I don't know what's the potential antidote to that 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 might spring to mind for you? Well, obviously, the antidote's unwelcome. Let's begin with the with the ending first, the possible solution that there's such a thing as an antidote. The antidote for a thin-skinned culture would be worse than any consequence of this thin skinness would be, right? In other words, if people genuinely wanted things to be different, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and suggest they'd probably be different. Accent on the word genuinely, no? I don't mean adamantly, I mean genuinely, in the sense of authentically, in the sense of fessing up to the limitations of what you can imagine by way of a solution. Understanding that most of your imagined solutions are one of the ways you got into this mess in the first place, right? So what's the thin skin that's come from? Well, I mean, by definition, thin skin is untested skin. It's a skin that's either been in the sun too long or is basically newborn. Uh, I think it's a sign of an unwillingness to experience the liveliness of life, to be frank. Uh, I wrote a chapter in the, in the elder book called something like, this is an important safety announcement. And I'd like to tell you the briefest of stories from that that might, might elucidate my rant here, my scold. And it's this, so I was, I was crossing from the mainland to Vancouver Island in British Columbia few years ago to teach at a, uh, a retreat center. I, I repent now. I'm sorry I did. Retreating is not for grown-ups, but anyway, I did. I took the money and I didn't even run. But uh, on the way over there, there was a young couple, maybe in their late 20s at the time, who I knew. And I knew that her father had very recently died. Like in the last, in the previous three or four days, very suddenly, very unexpectedly in reasonable health and all the rest. She herself was sitting across from me about six or seven months pregnant. So we all knew at a glance that she was living the remainder of her pregnancy with the impossible to placate understanding that this child within her would only know her father as a story and not as a presence. And that was there. And her husband-to-be was kind of lost at a distance, not knowing how to be present and so on. I mean, it's, a, it's not an unusual human circumstance, but it's as human as it gets. And as we were just beginning to converse and we were just setting out into the voyage, a voice came over the loudspeaker, a canned pre-recorded voice. And it said, this is an important safety announcement. And before it could continue, I leaned across the aisle and I said, there isn't any. That's the important safety announcement for grown-ups. And I dare say that the prevalent me first culture has missed the announcement. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. So Thanks. we're gonna open it up to some, some questions. We have some good ones already in the chat. Um, and there's there's one I was curious about uh, from, from Josh, Josh Uri. And Josh, if you want to um, unmute yourself and, and ask away. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for being here, Stephen. Um, really oh, Josh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just had a question. When you mentioned uh, psychedelics just now as a distraction when nearing death, if you meant that just in relation to the, the notion that we generally, without exception, tend to die as we lived and that psychedelics or anything else would be a distraction from that. Um, or if you meant more generally, uh, cause I, and Ollie and others, um, have been paying attention to, you know, a lot of reports and studies that seem to show uh, significant benefits with psychedelics for people nearing death and, and other parts of life as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's, look, it's a great question and it was an offhanded response, but I'll happy to elaborate, but let's begin with the, with a slight observation to make about the studies you're referring to and suggest the idea of benefit or optimal outcomes 
is still needs to be wondered about. I'm, I'm saying that because I'm fairly sure that the articulation of benefit when it comes to, you know, use of psychedelics as well, a bunch of other things basically derives from the dominant culture and its preferences and its predilections and its avoidances and its traumas as well. So another way of saying that would be the studies are as much a child of their times as they are any kind of solution to it. Yeah. So for what that's worth, just as something to consider, that's all. Um, well, people live as they die. And I said that as much of, as a lament as I did um, a, a simple observation, a journalistic kind of observation. Um, the reason for that is because in a death phobic culture, which is always the context you have to establish for making any kind of observation like I did. And so you'd wish anything, but that people from a death phobic culture die in the manner of their living. You'd wish that their dying at the very least would be an opportunity to proceed otherwise, but their repertoire for otherwise comes from the death phobia too. And I won't be surprised within a generation or two that the sudden uptake on hallucinogens and so on when it comes to dying people might subsequently be revealed as another consequence of the death phobia's utter unwillingness to challenge itself and simply go for door number two. That's an Aldous Huxley reference, by the way, door number two. Brilliant. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks, Stephen, as well. So we have a question as well from Adam. And Adam, if you want to unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi, Stephen. Hi. In the same way you say there's a, what's the obligation between the living and the dying, I wonder if you have a sense of an obligation between men and women in how to live together in, uh, in, in, a, in a healthy way. And I'm curious if you've uh, discovered any any wisdom from your work with dying uh, that could help heal the resentment and rift between men and women that is played out in our culture? Right. Well, it's a desperately hopeful question to ask. <laughs> and, and the only way the parallel works is if we have to identify either the men or the women as inhabiting the dying uh, part of the equation, no? But uh, I take the spirit of what you're asking. Um, I should say this. I've written four books, well, now five as of last week. And the, I wrote about money and the soul's desires. Then I wrote about dying. And then I wrote about elderhood and its, its vapid disappearance among us. And only then did I charge myself with the obligation of writing a book about matrimony. So those prior books were all stations of the cross, if you will, for me to approach the kind of um, monument to disorder, which is love between the genders. So I don't think that qualifies me for very much, but, but as, a, as a wounded participant in the fray, I could imagine the following. I'm not inventing the word matrimony. Most of us have used it. Some of us have entered into it, uh, unbeknownst to ourselves as well as willingly. I dare say virtually no one has been obliged in a ceremonial context to enter into the holy state of patrimony. I dare say nobody's even uttered the phrase before I just did. So it's worth considering in a culture that's mad for inclusivity, that there's no understanding of the obligation of people to enter together into something that could be called patrimonial. Why not? You know why as well as I do. Anything, any word that begins with P-A-T-R-I doesn't have many takers right now. Okay, so it's just important to recognize that etymology will never let us down. And the etymology of patrimony and matrimony is virtually the same, as you can tell by the sound. It's telling you that neither one of these things are identities. They're not personal identities. They're cultural functions. It's the act of fathering, not the act of procreating. It's the act of mothering, not the act of giving birth. So you could understand it from a, let's say from an elder's point of view, that it's the principal obligation of elders 
to participate in the mothering and fathering of the culture they're about to depart from. And to negotiate the, the repertoire for doing so is very specific and, and, and uh, very indigenous and belongs to a, a given place and time and shouldn't be generalized from, what's our problem? <laughs> I suspect our problem comes to this. In a time that's saturated by um, the notion of identity, it's the id, the ID part of identity that gets all the focus, the solitary singular self, the one that we spent so much time trying to become. For what it's worth, when I saw people dying, their self was the least of their preoccupations and probably sat on top of the pile of their regrets, their pursuit of, a, of an atomic self that disregarded the deep participation of other people, not romantically so much as kind of existentially. So the final thing I'd say about it is the, the meaning of your life is not really in your hands. You will find out, I don't mean you personally, but we'll all find out eventually, or sadly we won't, that the meaning of our life lies in the hands of the people who will not die as we do. The meaning of our life begins to be assembled in the wake, literally in the wake of our death. We are not there to participate or to exercise any kind of authority over it. If we learn the lesson about identity, that lesson, I dare say we probably die much more willingly dying unto the people that will survive us than we currently do. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Adam. Um, Jessica, you, you've posted um, something very uh, beautiful in the chat. I'd uh, love to hear your, your comment and question. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. I've heard you uh, speak of death as a deity, and I was recently able to witness a death in a um, setting where there was a community of people in a very well-held space um, where we were be able to be present through video to the dying person and also to become present within our own bodies. And it was such a profound experience for me that I think I'm beginning to understand what you mean about being in the presence of a deity. And, and I wonder with all of the gifts that are in that transformational space in the liminal space between living and dying, why do you think more people don't follow their curiosity to in that direction? And, and are you noticing that changing at all with you and other people speaking as death educators in the culture? Let me start with the last part first. Um, it would be really something if I woke up one day, looked out across the disturbed landscape of my particular culture and noticed consequences to what I've been trying to do for the last 20 years. But I'm here to report that my wife looked at me with great sympathy last week and reported to me that the likelihood of that is virtually nil. That is, nothing will be, will be changing in any discernible way during the course of my lifetime. So you have to find other reasons to do the work than personal uptake or sense of job satisfaction, right? Do I think that people, uh, and, and I should say to generalize about people, when we're talking about what we're talking about, does almost all of us a disservice. Sometimes you have to generalize to say anything, so I'll, I'll risk that second half and say, it's not my experience that people are curious about dying when they're dying. There's a kind of affordable curiosity that's a particular possession of the, the living, see? And so undigested Buddhism would tend most people to say, to get clever and say, oh, come on now, we're all dying all the time. You began dying the moment that you're born. Now, if that's true, and I'm not agreeing for a second that it is, what you would be well within your rights to do is go to the local palliative care center or old folks home where people are actively dying, lean into their dying ear and say, I know how it is, me too. Or you go visit uh, the home of a newborn and you look down into the bassinet at a days old little protein unit trying to become a person. And the parents are looking at you for waiting for the signs of, 
of affirmation and so on, and you say, not bad for a dying kid. But the likelihood of you saying that is virtually nil. Why? It's a deeply inconvenient fact because it does separate dying people from people who are not dying, have no interest in dying, have other plans and the rest. Those for whom dying talk is for dying people, for example. Dying talk is for living people. Everything we're talking about now is in the effort of trying to democratize some aspect of the death wisdom. Why? So that we can have better deaths, not better outcomes, better deaths. And the direct consequence of doing so is any curiosity about death becomes literacy about grief instead. And that's what I'm on about. And that's probably why you and I are speaking right now, at least on my side of the equation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica and Stephen. So we'll, we'll do one more question and then go into a, a short breakout before we finish uh, with, with, with a couple of more that might arise from that breakout. And uh, Jochen, um, you have a question. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, Stephen, thanks so much for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Um, for me personally, at the moment, I feel many, many times in my life, as I'm still <laughs> very much alive, that there's many things that I would like to do for which I require courage, some kind of like stance of not feeling afraid. And similarly, I think, yeah, looking death in the face and not, not flinch seems to also take courage. So I'd be curious if you could say something about how you found courage and how you like imagine people might find courage in their life generally. Right. Well, first of all, I don't think you find courage. If you did, and somebody just have to write a book saying where to find it and everybody be more courageous and wouldn't that be something? So far, that hasn't happened. It's because it's courage finds you. That's my first suggestion. Here's the second one. It's not up to you then to engineer it. Ah, if you're on the receiving end of it, you have to cultivate a proneness to it, not a mastery of it, right? So you have to succumb to courage. Imagine that as a t-shirt. Wouldn't that be something? If you do it, cut me in for a percentage, please. Okay. Thirdly, <laughs> thirdly, I just thought of this recently. I don't know why, but for whatever it's worth, here it goes. Courage seems to me to be the consequence of choice. Here's what I mean. A certain circumstance uh, presents itself to you. A trying and testing one. An unnerving one or worse. You have the possibility not to choose. That's one of the choices available to you. You could, you could waffle and, and, and so on, right? You could extend the illusion of your choices, you know, into your years and beyond. But for some reason, you do choose. And then you act. Courage is a consequence of choice. No choice, no courage. What do you have instead? You have what I have, which is, I have no choice on these matters. I was attending to these people who were dying. I never imagined it would inform the rest of my life. It has done so. I have a self-appointed obligation to the people who let me into their dying time to proceed as if what I saw was what I saw and to faithfully witness to that fact. And that's what you hear me doing now. And this is why I don't have any access to grind or I don't have a horse in the race, so to speak, and no skin in the game, no? What I have instead is, by virtue of that obligation, I have no choice, you see? So you're looking at and listening to someone who's simply obedient instead of courageous. And if I had the choice, I'd probably opt for courage, but I don't. So I'm just observant instead. That's what I came up with. So we have time for about one more, and uh, James W. Gesso. I know this name. Yes. <laughs> uh, hello, Stephen. Uh, thank you for uh, what you've offered today. Thank you. James. So um, this question's half written down. I'm probably slightly confused, and I trust you'll uh, you'll make something out of it. Okay. Uh, 
So speaking about death phobic culture, we're likely in that culture to have rituals and funeral practices that are reflective of that death phobia. And there are places where funeral practices still reflect what, for lack of better terms, might be a death integrated culture, or I think you've used the term an intact culture. Um, Like perhaps uh, in the breakout session, I was speaking with uh, two other people and we were talking about My Father's Wake by Kevin Toulis, who talked about the Irish death practices. Um, So I'm wondering in your travels, if you've encountered anywhere or any places where it seemed as though the death phobia was present, and yet there seemed to be an emerging of cultural practices, funeral practices, rituals that were reflective something of a post-death phobic way. Um, And if there was anything that you kind of sensed that they were able to grok that led them to that or or grasp or understand that led them to that. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, First first suggestion would be to reconsider the notion of post-death phobic. That's kind of like I had spinal meningitis when I was three and a half years old. I don't consider myself to be post meningitis, which is to say (laughs) that everything about it is present and accounted for, has consequence, and I ignore that at my peril, right? So it's the same with death phobia. The cultures that you're imagining right now would be would not have put thrown their death phobia under the proverbial bus there. What they probably would have done, and you can tell I'm speaking in the hypothetical now, because no, I can't think of a place that I've been to, and I'm gonna tell you why momentarily, where, where this exists, but this doesn't prevent us from actively engaging in wondering what it might take to get there. And we're, we're not prevented from that. So uh, let me join you and try to do it. So, so what you would do with your death phobia is befriend it, the way death literate cultures befriend death. And what is the signal feature of friendship? The willingness to risk the friendship itself for the sake of the friend. Greater love hath no man, in other words. So that might sound like, could you say that again? Because I couldn't quite follow the, yes, I'll try. I'm suggesting to you that death affirming cultures are by definition life affirming cultures. Not two, I'm leaving the word two out of there. That's what they're doing by affirming death, right? They're saying amen to every aspect of life rather than paying it lip service as people where I come from do by saying, well, death's part of life too, when they don't actually mean it. What they mean is that death is the annihilating part of life where life doesn't survive it. See, so that's no, there's no, (laughs) there's no resuscitation of your capacity for life by insisting that death is part of life. It's, It's a shell game on the corner. So death capable cultures, let's imagine that they've gone through an extended and withering period of death phobia that might have been a consequence of the cultural dislocation that I was talking about much earlier. And in so doing, do they reinstitute themselves around the goneness of that rupture? Or do they understand the rupture as the foundation principle of their capacity to live deeply and to die wisely. I'm suggesting it's probably the second one, that they take every one of the things we would call traumas or phobias and not fetishize it, not turn into a golden calf, but give it its proper due. So so my advocacy is befriend that which would seem to uh, undo your friendship and in so doing, discover the nature of friendship radicalized so that it doesn't become an aspect of the things you prefer in a friend. And it becomes the very limit of what you're capable of in terms of acting on behalf of the friendship. That's what we owe, culturally speaking, uh, to each other. It seems to me is, 
is make room for what would undo us and learn from its capacity to undo us. And there are casualties along the way, there's no doubt of it. And I'm not volunteering to be a casualty and I'm not suggesting that there's individuals that are casualties and individuals that are beneficiaries. I'm suggesting that if you're interested in being a culture worker, which I understand myself to be, then your, your principal allegiance is to sanity, to cultural sanity, not to intactness. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. That was a, a really powerful and beautiful place to end and fitting as well. So thank you so much for, for coming back on Rebel Wisdom. And uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Let me say it was an, a really compelling encounter. Uh, the questions are really do justice to your efforts to try to gather this conclave together. And I'm, I'm really the beneficiary of the invitation. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Stephen. That's very kind. Yeah, and um, yeah, you did beautifully. So thanks a lot. And thanks everyone for your brilliant questions. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sense makers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense-making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.